Hey, hello. Uh, welcome to one and all uh, to this panel celebrating the publication of Reinhold Martin's new book, uh, Knowledge Worlds, Media, Materiality, and the Making of the Modern University, which just came out from Columbia University Press. Uh, my name is Lucia Ale. I'm an uh, associate professor uh, of architecture at Columbia University's GSAP. I'll be the moderator for the event, which is being co-hosted by three Columbia institutions to which Reinhold belongs the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, the Society of Fellows and Heyman Center for the Humanities, and the Center for Comparative Media. And my job is to introduce the panelists and later to moderate the discussion and open it up to a QA. and a um, You should see a Q&A box uh, on your screen where you can submit your questions for me to read out loud. Uh, feel free to do so at any time uh, during uh, the presentation. So. Um, I'll begin by introducing our panelists and our guest of honor today is of course Reinhold Martin. Reinhold is professor of architecture at the Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, where he also directs or is involved in, in, in an impressive number of uh, endeavors. He's a director of the Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture. Um, he's a director of history and theory at GSAP. Um, he's a director of the Heyman Center. He's a member of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society and the Committee on Global Thought. Um, I also want to add that in my field, architecture, history, and theory, Reinhold is one of those rare authors whose books are eagerly awaited and widely read and hotly debated across subfields because they are not only uncovering new archival material uh, or material that's been overlooked, but also offer interpretations that um, push the field to rethink entire areas of building production. So just to remind us all, this was true of Reinhold's first book, The Organizational Complex, uh, Architecture, Media, and Corporate Space was the subtitle. This came out in 2003. It completely changed the study of what was then called corporate architecture. Um, this was also true of subsequent books that he wrote or co-wrote or co-edited, just to name two, Utopia's Ghost. I have them here. Utopia's Ghost, 2010, which re-described the relationship of late capital to postmodern facades and other uh, sort of language games of architecture. And uh, the more recent Urban Apparatus, a 2016 book, which um, rediscovered the city as a kind of media apparatus. So Reinhold's fourth book, Knowledge World, which we're celebrating today, is a provocation to rethink the university, um, which I don't think I'm spoiling the, the surprise by saying that uh, the argument is that the university is a corporation, um, and it's also a spatial technical network. So uh, congratulations to Reinhold. And before he, I let him introduce his own book, um, I'll introduce the panelists. Um, as you can have guessed from what I just said, Reinhold is read across fields and the panelists we have today reflect this. So uh, first we will hear from um, Wei Hong Bao, who is associate professor in the departments of film and media and East Asian languages and literature at UC Berkeley. She's the author of Fiery Cinema, The Emergence of an Effective Medium in China, 1915 to 1945. And she's also involved in a number of things, including um, uh, being on the editorial board of Feminist Media History. Um, we will then hear from Mabel Wilson, who is Nancy and George Rupp Professor of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. She's also a professor of African-American and African Diasporic Studies at Columbia. And she's the director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia. She's the author of two books, including Race and uh, including Negro Building. She's the editor of the very important recent book, Race and Modern Architecture. And she's also one of the curators of the recent uh, book, uh, sorry, the recent show, which is up at the moment now called uh, Reconstructions. Uh, last but not least, we will also have a response from Zeynep Chalik Alexander, who is an associate professor in the Department of Art History at Columbia. She's the author of Kinesthetic Knowing, Aesthetics, Epistemology, Modern Design. She also co-edited with John May a collection titled Design Techniques. She's an editor of Grey Room and at Columbia, she co-directs the Center for Comparative Media. So, uh, Reinhold, congratulations on the book. And I'll uh, leave the floor to you to um, introduce your own book. So each panelist will have eight minutes roughly. And then at the end, we will have a kind of uh, either questions across the panel and we will start taking and reading questions from the Q&A as well. Reinhold, take it away. Well, um, well, thank you, Lucia, for this very uh, far too generous and, and but certainly effusive and humbling uh, introduction. And it, it really is wonderful to be here 
with everyone, um, however we are here, uh, whatever, wherever that is, um, and uh, to, to discuss, um, you know, not just the, this book, but, but also what it is that we do as, as scholars, as academics, and uh, as producers uh, of knowledge in various ways. But before I begin, I, I really do want to say um, how humbled I am uh, to be hosted uh, by two institutions, in addition to my home institution, GSAP, um, to, to other institutions, the Center for Comparative Media uh, and the Society of Fellows, uh, Heyman Center for the Humanities, um, that in, in different but intersecting ways have offered me intellectual homes during the years uh, of writing, uh, writing this book. Uh, you know, in a way, this book is inseparable from my own involvement with both of these institutions and, and formally uh, in um, the case of Society of Fellows, Hammond Center, uh, the, the experience of, of chairing uh, the board, the faculty board of this organization until uh, last year, which, um, I mean, you know, all of these are in, in this, I, I've said this informally to friends, but this was all kind of field work. So maybe, you know, people will, some, some will see some traces of these experiences in the book itself. Um, so, but, but along, and, and of course, along with, the, with, with, with these comes the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, uh, which is I have to, really where the book begins uh, and quite literally, um, uh, and the Committee on Global Thought. Um, uh, all, all of these settings have provided precious opportunities to learn from colleagues um, in, in, these, in different ways uh, <clears throat> uh, to basically to, to think together uh, about what it is that we do um, outside and between the, the departmental citadels uh, from which this and other universities are assembled. I also want to thank my wise and patient editor, Philip Leventhal, and, and indeed the entire team at Columbia University Press, without whom books like this simply could not exist. And, and we owe them immense gratitude for all the work that, 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 that they do, um, and I personally. Uh, and at SOF Heyman, I especially want to thank Eileen Gillooly for her interstitial imagination in giving form to spaces like the one we share today, this, this forum. What better way to begin a discussion about universities as media uh, than to note that this is among the first events to be featured on the elegant new SOF HCH website, uh, which merges its two acronyms in a new symmetrical logo. Uh, of course, behind all such emblems is the work of many others. And so I thank Kelly, Tess, Kay, and Lindsay uh, at SOF HCH and Alex at CCM, as well as the ever-present Lila Catelier uh, at GSAP for their help in getting today's uh, rescheduled discussion off the ground. Now, the ground in question, of course, remains dispersed wherever we are, but I speak uh, to you today from near the Columbia campus in Morningside Heights, uh, in New York, which, which sits in Lenape Hoking, the unceded ancestral land of the Lenape, Lenape peoples. Now, it can sometimes seem awkward to offer such acknowledgement without further comment, let alone action. Here, I only add that one chapter in Knowledge Worlds gives a partial account of how the remediation of indigenous lands gave birth to another comparable campus, uh, and the one at UC Berkeley. <clears throat> With a symbolic and within a symbolic and political economy of the frontier, the frontier uh, that continues to govern many campuses, uh, including our own, which uh, I believe still offers in the in the core course called Frontiers of Science. I also note that it was also it was possible to reschedule this discussion, our discussion today, due only to a pause in the strike by the graduate workers of Columbia who continue to pursue a contract with the university. That the GWC have allied with the factory built United Auto Workers says much, I think, about what has changed since the 1960s when Berkeley students derisively characterized their own institution as a knowledge factory. But divisions of labor are durable under capitalism 
And as I've also tried to show in the book, uh, colleges and universities have long been organized around them. With the symmetries and asymmetries implied by the GWC UAW acronym, our students offer an object lesson, I think, in solidarity across and along front, the front lines. Finally, in a kindred spirit of solidarity, uh, albeit much farther from the front, I humbly thank my fellow knowledge workers, Wei Hong Bao, Mabel Wilson, Zeynep Celik Alexander, and Lucia Ale, for their immense generosity in, in literally taking the time to read this book uh, and, uh, and, and reflect today uh, on its arguments. So in order to, to try to sort of encourage uh, maybe some of you to, to, all to read the book, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna read from it. I'm just gonna try to summarize um, some of, of, of the, the arguments that I try to make there. So what are they? What are those arguments? Well, put succinctly, Knowledge Worlds argues that colleges and universities in, in the United States over the course of two centuries have been and remain provisional solutions to boundary problems regarding the production, storage, uh, and transmission of knowledge. So I, you know, I try to explain this in, the, in the, uh, a series of scenes, really, um, that, that are interspersed throughout the book, intercut, really, uh, uh, among the chapters. And the, in the book's opening scene, um, which takes, the, takes place at the outskirts, outskirts of a campus, it's actually at, out, outside of Washington University in St. Louis, uh, in a conference hotel. Uh, so something familiar probably to many of us here redefines the interplay of world and text expounded there, that was expounded at this conference in a hotel in a lecture by Edward Said. Um, and, and I try to, in a sense, redefine this interplay in terms of an expansive media complex that includes that lecture's setting, uh, the several iterations of the ensuing essay that became Said's The World, the Text and the Critic of 1983, very influential essay, and book, and the material circumstances of its dissemination. But beginning a book about US colleges and universities in this way, especially a book bearing the ponderous subtitle, Media, Materiality, and the Making of the Modern University, is also a way of acknowledging a certain provincialism. Uh, since, since, of course, whatever is distinctly modern about US institutions, uh, is also a function of their imperious blindness, uh, the malign consequences of which Said did so much to disclose. In that sense, this is a book about the small technical details of which knowledge worlds are made, um, details in, that include extra, extramural hardware, like the dumbwaiter built into Thomas Jefferson's dining room at Monticello, which animated learned conversation at the table uh, by reproducing with every pull the enslaved silence of those below. And there are many tables and there's, there's quite a bit of sort of hidden infrastructure also um, that, that I, I try to reveal in, in a way or at least interpret in, in the book. The book collects such details across almost two centuries from antebellum, antebellum uh, recitations to neoliberal laboratories. Given my own disciplinary origins, uh, <clears throat> the making and unmaking of boundaries with the help of walls, floors, uh, doors, gates, windows, screens, axes, uh, and other mediating instruments offers rich occasion for doing media history with architecture. So doing history with architecture rather than a media history of architecture, where media names a method really as much as or even more than uh, a domain of objects, as, as you, can, you can tell from the list of things that I just offered. That history's archive, uh, for example, includes what architects call materials, like brick and stone, but also seeds and oil. Recast here, such that in one important case, what mattered most for stone was that it was not brick, and dialectically for brick, that it was not stone. 
Now I'll try not to sum up, I, I, I won't try, I will not be able to sum up here all the many parts, pieces, or types of institutions across the country uh, covered in the book's eight chapters, which run from the birth of the collegiate corporate person around 1800 through the electroacoustic rise of research universities around 1900 to the spiritualized technopoetic networks of the so-called multiversity after the Second World War and from Dartmouth to Arizona to Tuskegee to MIT. Instead, I'll just conclude this brief little intro uh, by highlighting, highlighting just two of the book's uh, key concepts. So I'm, I'm gonna sort of um, read some sense, definitions uh, from, that are from the introduction. The first concept is that of a media complex, which I, I define as uh, a network of material infrastructures, operations, and techniques through which human beings know themselves and their world. So within these networks, to write, read, speak, or hear something is to know that it can be known. All academic knowledge is, by this definition, worldly knowledge, the output and input of media complexes. So, you know, understanding the university as a media complex in this way allows us to map the shifting topologies of knowledge. And, and in many ways, I, I've come to think of this book as a kind of map too. Uh, or the connections and conflicts of which insides and outsides, inclusions and exclusions are made. Uh, such that, for example, scholars can sit quietly in libraries, reflecting on their representations as though watching a movie in Plato's cave. The second key concept with run, which runs, which really runs mostly in the background, I don't really use the term uh, that much, it also appears in the um, uh, previous book that Uchiha mentioned, uh, The Urban Apparatus, uh, is that of media politics uh, as, as one word, uh, which I define as a politics and a technics of the in-between. Media politics names the power relations of ordering and knowing as the human social subjects of technics make worlds appear through media, um, where technics is a matter of making things and being made by them, of reciprocally shaping and being shaped by technological environments. Studying media political processes means, for example, taking in classic enlightenment doctrine, <clears throat> classic enlightenment doctrine like Kant's conflict of the faculties as literally as possible by considering the material inf infrastructures that, in, that elevate one faculty uh, above the other. This is Kant's basically, the, he's, he's describing the schema of the, the, the sort of early 19th century German universities made up of higher and lower faculties. Technically, I teach in a higher faculty, a professional school, uh, because it's closer to the sovereign, which is to say today, capital. Um, <clears throat> In any case, um, in this way, like the chain, the chain that appears, I think it's kind of a bit overlooked, this chain in Hegel that binds Lord to bondsman or master to, to slave uh, in the famous dialectic. Media politics enacts a dialectic of dialectics, wherein conflicts of various types, so a, a kind of cascade of conflicts of various types and magnitudes, including those that govern any faculty meeting or indeed any culture war, are shaped not only by opposing bodies of knowledge, but also by the tables at which those bodies sit. So I'll leave it there for now with the thought that someday soon we might once again sit around tables to discuss ideas. And I'm gonna be, be happy to offer more detailed examples or discuss more specific histories from the book in the Q&A. But in the meantime, I cede the gridded screen to my esteemed colleagues who may well have better ideas than I. Thank you, Reinhold. Um, and Wei Hung is uh, ready. Um, please, Wei Hung, go ahead. You might need to. There you go. Uh, yeah. 
So thank you so much. I also want to thank the Society of Fellow and Heyman Center for the humanities for this wonderful invitation and opportunity to read through Reinhold's marvelous book. Um, and as the only non-architecture historian on this panel, I must say I'm standing here with a great deal of trepidation, but the book has been so inviting in consciously crossing a number of borders that it gives me a little license to share my thoughts as a so-called media scholar that that term and title have been exploded and entirely transformed by this book. Uh, in fact, I take tremendous joy and inspiration from the book precisely by its ease, but also great care to cross and reconfigure the vast terrain of our knowledge worlds, making us rethink disciplinary divides, be it art and architecture history, critical theory, intellectual history, media theory, political philosophy, to name a few. Knowledge Worlds has certainly opened an entirely new world to me, reaching far back in history, but also forward as our universities, as the microcosm and mirror of society undergo another major transformation. Like a thick forest that invites repeated visits, knowledge world certainly requires multiple crossings and creative pathways in order to enjoy its miraculous sceneries. I will take a short stroll on the media path, one of the major lines that cross through the book. And so I was very much interested and in, um, intrigued by the way that media has been uh, approached in this book. Uh, media in this book for me is many splendid things, or maybe it's better to call it as an assemblage of multiple components. Uh, so first of all, media is matter uh, in terms of the brick and stone, um, but the matter is never separated from form, right? So I was struck by this term that uh, Raiho mentioned, the brick is always becoming stone. There's always a kind of aspiration towards the symbolic. And matter also needs its processing that uh, extend toward many hands. So he really brings in the question of labor and race and gender in thinking about how many total hands were involved in that technical uh, economic process. Uh, the second aspect to think about the media is really to think about the form, and that form also very much links it to symbolic form. Uh, and I think he takes the inspiration from Panofsky, but also really to extend that notion of the symbolic form as a spatial schema that connects the cognitive and spatial, but also the psychological and social, and eventually really has to do with the uh, establishment of this ever-shifting threshold that I will come back to. Uh, another aspect in thinking about the media is to think about the structure, but also uh, not so much in terms of the structure as a standing one uh, or a standing construction, but really thinking about the infrastructure, right? So this is why the in-between becomes so important. And for me, I take particular delight in just underlying how many prepositions appear in this book. Um, and I was struck by how uh, Reinhold uh, kind of revises John Peters' play of McLuhan's understanding media. Uh, when you say, um, uh, actually, Peters talk about infrastructure media as media that stand under, and instead you revise that uh, preposition into infrastructure media are media that stand between like any foundation. So foundation is no longer what stands under, but what stands between. That changes the kind of vertical structure or depth model of understanding to a more lateral movement that also involves a simultaneous backward and forward movement in time and space that you should just so uh, agilely uh, orchestrate throughout the book and reciting so many uh, prepositions that you use in and out, up and down, through and below. Uh, and so inside the um, Low Library, there's the brilliant Indian scholar Brimra Amdeka, who is um, precise, uh, who is uh, reading Under the Moon, 
uh, this artificial moon, which is the techniques of um, uh, uh, orchestrating and manipulating light. And in Chicago, inside the Rockefeller Chapel, uh, this space of what you call it as a double dub psychoacoustic space, sound return from around and behind the so-called master. Um, and so I think on a kind of a more grander uh, level, we're really thinking about this kind of in between as linking the visible and the invisible. Uh, and I quote you again, uh, how this kind of linked up one set of historical forces in terms of the visible sequence of libraries, domes and lighting system with another set running underneath, between and through them. Um, and so in that sense, I think media is, you really provide a very radical conception of media as fundamentally the middle, the in-between that separates and connects, the intermediary that mediates. And um, so in a way, it's not surprising for me to see how the book outlines four genealogies in terms of the collegiate body, the time and voice and sign into what you call as the genealogy of the border. Uh, and this kind of inside outside uh, techniques uh, is also what folds in the outside, but at the same time turns the inside out. At the same time, I think you are very much aware that border it's never a kind of hard entrenched one, but it's a broken and fragile line that's constantly shifting. And so I guess um, if, if there's a kind of meta comment on um, how you define media, we can think about how media is being defined in terms of moving away from the being of media to the doing of media, from the object to the process from isolated entities to interrelated system, to networks of networks of media complex as you coin it, which serves as affordance of knowledge and freedom, the very rationale and logistics of what you describe as the long recursive passage from liberal to neoliberal reason. But I also want to use that as a way to think about uh, the book itself, becomes an example of what Ivar Holm uh, describes as the best media studies is actually interdisciplinary. At its most creative media theory might not be a field in itself, but rather an interdisciplinary crossover or a transdisciplinary pursuit. And so I'll quickly come to my second point and just raise my question now. And, and so my very, um, quick second question is, I was really struck by your simultaneous emphasis on media politics. And so your inquiry of techniques is never separated from that of the regime of power. And so very strikingly, you put forth this twofold formulation of power as practices of energetics that involve question of labor and physical force, and also the question of hegemony. Uh, and so I very much appreciate how the book adds a distinct accent to media analytic framework. You quite consistently incorporate, which is usually what we call in terms of cultural techniques, in terms of thinking about the elementary techniques, the matter of distinction making, media in its elementary sense as ordering principle, in thinking about system before media proper. Yet what you heighten is to couple the media a priori with a political a priori. Right, so what you emphasize is really the mutual constitu constitution. And I was particularly excited to see how you wrote emphatically and unapologetically, I quote, technology is social and therefore subject to the daily struggle of human agents. The study of media politics is therefore one way of understanding media historically and politically at once. Okay, so I will end with very briefly, uh, let, let me think, um, maybe three quick questions. The first one is the role of cybernetics as method. Um, as you very much aware, I think you're really quite consistently and consciously approaching the vocabulary of cybernetics Netics in thinking about terms such as recursion, closed system, circuit, input, output, relay, um, to really uh, try to grasp and process this very complex historical 
uh, process of uh, the university world as the knowledge world in the making. And so I do want to pose a question of the relationship between reflexivity and recursivity. Right. So I think those two are very much linked and in some sense, uh, they're, they really become one thing. The reflexivity also becomes a technical process of recursivity. And so how does that become a critical method in terms of reflection of this historical process as well as your own critical method? Um, and also how you, as a kind of a writing uh, method, Right, so that's that's something I want to think about. I think I also want to quote you when you talk about, for example, in the case of Chicago, how the pedagogy of hermeneutics turns into a kind of format of uh, of uh, logistic. So I wonder if you want to reflect upon that in terms of your own writing process. The second question of the question of the human, which I just quickly go into when you talk about when you quote. Um, uh, uh, um, Monfort in thinking about the human use of the human, and you mentioned that this is not antithetical to techniques, but a product of it. And so uh, you very much emphasize on um, the human machine interface and university to a large extent is this kind of grand machinery in processing. Uh, and transforming the making of the humanity. And so I do want to ask uh, when we're living in the age when many of our humanities scholars are kind of so positioning of in defense of humanities, how do you rethink the so-called humanities methods and knowledge uh, in relation to this age when we cannot think about the human without thinking about the machine. And the third last question is the term media complex, which I think also goes back to your first book, The Organizational Complex. If media uh, in the kind of more quote is quintessential sense is a matter of organization, I feel interestingly uh, to link back to your first book, there's also another notion of complex, which is probably less technical, but more psychoanalytical, right? So there's a kind of interesting psychoanalysis of our media com complex today that I wonder if you want to comment on. Okay, I'll just end my comment. So thank you again for this wonderful opportunity. Amazing set of questions. Uh, we could have a university seminar on those questions. Um, but I will ask Reinhold to hold his response um, and uh, offer the flow over to, uh, thank you, Weihang, very much, and um, offer the flow over to Mabel, who will share a screen, is that right? Um, so yeah, go ahead and share as soon as you're ready. And uh, there you go. Okay. And you could see that, correct? Perfect. I cannot see you, but so long as you could see the screen, perfect. So. So I want to, you know, first one, just thank the Society of Fellows, the Heyman Center, uh, for the invitation to join this discussion without a doubt, uh, without, for what is without a doubt, um, a cracking good read. Um, so sincere congratulations to my colleague, friend, and occasionally co-conspirator for this important work, um, you know, that is, was discussed, I think will contribute across uh, not only a range of disciplines, but also within our field of architecture and its subfields. I would say one of the things um, is that knowledge most really heightens its readers to the very apparatuses, the archives, libraries, classrooms, auditorium, books, sounds, light, machines, ideas, policies, curricula that fuse together the educational systems that make our teaching, research, and study even this event possible. A student mindful, Reinhold dives into a genealogical cloud of the modern university with all of its obfuscations and changeabilities to trace lineages of disciplines, discourses, institutions, corporations, persons, and their relationships that animate the ways of knowing the world made modern. Central to this remarkable effort is to draw those lofty ideals and ideas promulgated by our universities down into the messy materialities that mediate how we come to know. One of the primary mediums constructing the world of the modern university is its architecture, both its physical manifestation and building, as well as its representational art 
arsenal of drawings, specifications, digital models, maquettes, and so on. So in various forums, though not explicitly in knowledge world, Reinhold has been emphatic that first and foremost, architectural drawings function as instruments. They communicate information and not just to, to students learning the basis of design and professional protocols, but to clients whose needs are being met through contractual relationships with architects, to planning and community boards who ensure buildings comply with legal and legislative dictates and collective needs, and to construction workers who read the drawings in order to erect buildings. As such, drawings are mediums. Drawings are the one things that architects do make. We do not build buildings. So if we hone into what they actually communicate, act and after all, the devil, or God for some, is in the detail as one reads through knowledge world, architectural drawings accumulate a dense amalgam of information about procedures of assembly, materials, dimensions, scales, global networks, professional relationships, um, and knowledge, which is typically contributed not by a single person, which might be the name of the, the firm, but actually by multiple actors. So given its cumulative surface, the drawing undermines the elevated stature of the single authored building, a common feature in architectural monographs that extol the genius and virtuosity of the architect. Therefore, buildings and their representational trails can be ciphers, fragments of evidence from which one can make sense of the past. And in many ways, this characterizes the methodological ambition of knowledge worlds, as Reinhold intimates in his preface. Quote, my hope is nonetheless is that a patient reading will show how doing history with architecture reanimates the language of space, languages of space, form, utility, and meaning. And so I would love to hear more about what does it mean to do history with architecture in all of its pragmatist invent, intent and how this widens the toolkit of historiographic practices. Therefore, if we can write history with architectural media, what can it tell us? Reinhold turns as he said in his introduction, to dumbwaiters. More precise, Thomas Jefferson's dumbwaiters hidden in the fireplace mantle of the dining room at his plantation, Monticello. The Monticello Foundation, the current stewards of Jefferson's home, refers to the dumbwaiter as a gadget, an ingenious tool, quote, built into the architecture to minimize the number of slaves present, end quote. Now, perhaps to do history with architecture necessitates that the dumbwaiter be more than a gadget and instead an apparatus within a heterogeneous ensemble. So in the words of Foucault, an apparatus is, quote, the systems of relations that can be established between elements, the details. That's where the drawing, the building section, becomes instructive. And there are many of them in the, in the, in the book. The plans, their sections. So let's see one of them. So in it, we locate above the dining room for Jefferson and his guests, and below the wine cellar where his enslaved servants labored to prepare and deliver, deliver their sumptuous meal. The floor, it's wooden joists and air space, those, the, although those are not rendered in this particular type of drawing, acts as a buffer between the voices of the dinner, dinner guests and the ears of the enslaved. That system of relations is what is productive of sound attenuation or rather of silence. As Reinhold sketches for us, quote, the dumbwaiter then did not merely regulate the boundaries of a sphere that was reserved in the Kantian sense, for the public exercise of reason, it helped produce that sphere by minimizing interference and distortion and restringing transmission and communication in a manner that, as in Hegel's dialectic of lordship and bondage, ontically differentiated master and slave, quote. As we read further into that section, just labeled dumbwaiters, 
we learn that Jefferson outfitted the room with numerous other details. Rotating service shelves for the food, movable carts as another form of dumbwaiter for dishes. These created a spatial distance and time limitations for how whiteness interfaced with blackness, reinforcing a racialized social order. As Reinhold explains, quote, all of, which, all of this, which was designed to encourage Jefferson's carefully chosen dinner guests, something very close to what Immanuel Kant called in his in remarks on the Enlightenment, quote, and this is Kant, the inclination and vocation of free thinking intrinsic to man who is now more than a machine in accord with his dignity, quote. So this apparatus, the dumbwaiter, and all of its other elements that are assembled within the room, within the house, within the plantation, makes the liberal subject liberated from the chains of unreason, while also distanced from the dark abyss of enforced ignorance. Now, in a later chapter, Diffuse Illumination, The Silence of the Universal, we follow a dialectic, as Reinhold explained, of silence and illumination in two reading rooms at the University of Virginia and Columbia University. Here, he traces the various interfaces and materializations for how the dining room apparatus of Monticello, Monticello becomes a template for the silent reading spaces at UVA. In an 1810 letter cited in this chapter, Jefferson sketched the rudimentary plans for an academical village of separate barracks for professors connected by a covered, covered passage to rooms for students. In a second part of this letter that is not included in the citation, Jefferson expressed concerns that overcrowded dormitories weren't conducive, quote, to health, to study, to manners, morals, and order, end quote. Thus, what architecture's organizational function can facilitate is in constituting a social order, wherein its residents, its citizen subjects, receive physical, intellectual, social, and ethical tutelage. While this may be an idealized sphere of enlightenment, it nonetheless necessitated other apparatuses to satisfy the basic human needs of elimination, bathing, rest, and su sustenance. Thus, if we look closely at a section of Jefferson's design at UVA, we find the same material and spatial arrangements of Monticello adapted to accommodate those relationships between the educational pursuits of faculty and students and the labor of enslaved men, women, and children. Turning once more to the architectural drawing, the section reveals the two-story facade of the pavilions facing the lawn differs from the three-story rear facade that opens onto work yards spaces that can be surveilled, where the enslaved washed clothing, smoked meat, slaughtered animals, repaired furniture, chopped wood, and so on, and so on. And so you could see the left, the section, that part on the right, you see that scale, the space of the student and the professor, and then on the right, the relationship between the professor, right, on the, the left side of that, that, that uh, sectional drawing. Um, the ways in which that opens then out into this, this work yard. And then the, that right, I mean, you, you could see, and this is a, a drawing that sort of highlights the spaces of surveillance from that rear facade of the pavilion into, into that, that yard. So the famous serpentine walls stretching between the lawn and the range were originally taller than they are today. And it is believed that their purpose was to buffer the noise limit the visibility and mask the odors emanating from the work yards, producing again, as Reinhold described at Monticello, a sphere for the exercise of reason, the public exercise of reason. Each brick, which is why they're, they're single, single brick thick, which then the sort of undulation allows for a static structure so that each brick molded and originally stacked by enslaved hands was a means to quell the dissonance of slavery 
that made freedom possible. And on a similar note, Reinhold astutely concludes the chapter on diffuse illumination that quote, silence thereby grounds the democratic and pedagogical order of letters. To call this order universal in the sense that it speaks to all and for all is also to acknowledge the myriad and different ways in which it by definition does not, end quote. So one last thought on this insightful history with its focus on media, techna, and poesis and what it provokes. I just wanted to show this as well. This is an 1830 census data overlaid onto a plan of the university. And you could see the distribution of the enslaved in relationship uh, to the students and the faculty. And there were in fact, at that moment, more enslaved workers at the university than there actually were students. And so the architecture really functions sort of a, as an apparatus to basically produce these sort of in-between spaces where that work can operate, but nonetheless not disrupt, right? That, that um, space of public reason. So one last thought on this insightful history, and this is precisely what I think Reinhold brought up in, in his introduction is um, that the specter of why laboring bodies, wage laborers, those who maintain and care for the institutional apparatus fundamental to its operations, which could also include the labor of teaching, continues to prove dissonant within these knowledge worlds. Thank you. Thank you, Mabel. Incredible connection between the, the waviness of the wall and the effects of the university. Um, and I will ask everyone to continue holding their questions and you, the audience is free to put questions in the chat or in the Q&A and Reinhold to hold his responses to these questions uh, so that we may have our last panelist, Zainab Chalik Alexander. Zainab, go ahead. Hello, I too um, will begin by thanking the Society of Fellows, GSAP, and my fellow uh, colleagues at the Center for Comparative Media. It's really genuinely a great pleasure and honor to respond to this remarkable, ooh, that's blur too, remarkable book. Um, my response ended up being on one of the words in the title of the book, Materiality, though I suspect that the tools of architectural history that Mabel talked about so beautifully have something to do with the kind of material history that the book offers. So in a way, I'll also ask, what does it mean to do media history with architecture? When I was trying to put together notes for this response, I ended up looking at the Yale report of 1828, a forceful defense of classical education by Yale faculty against those who argued that Greek and Latin were dead languages. As I read the text, I was struck by how many times the image of architecture was evoked. The object of college is to lay the foundation of a superior education, the report reads. A costly edifice cannot be left to rest upon a single pillar. The cornerstone must be laid before the superstructure is erected. The groundwork of a thorough education must be broad and deep and solid and cannot be built on looser materials more hastily laid and so on and on. I mean, this is just a small selection of the dozens of uh, architectural uh, uh, references. So much talk of architectural matter, I thought, for a text that adamantly makes the case that it is the mind that builds the body that insists that one's intellectual faculties are the ultimate furniture of one's mind without support from what the authors of the report unexpectedly call the whole apparatus of the university. It's other furniture consisting of libraries, laboratories, instruments, specimens, and even its teachers. Knowledge Worlds, of course, is precisely about that apparatus and makes a compelling case that the foundation that the 1828 report keeps talking about is just another wall. Many scholars today will sympathize with this kind of anti-foundationalist thinking, but few, I suspect, will manage to practice a materialism that ultimately does not stray into the idealism of the Yale report of 
in some way. And let me just say here that while we may think we're free from the kind of thinking you find in that report, some of its assumptions persist in surprising ways in discussions of um, core curriculum, for example. Furthermore, there are other temptations these days that the Yale report conceives matter as dead, loose debris to be dismissed, Recent new materialisms have endowed it with agency and self-organizing powers in a manner that also borders on idealism, at least as far as I'm concerned. So what I want to do in my 10 minutes then is to take Reinhold's critical lead and start speculating about how the book may be offering a kind of materialist thinking that might help us stay clear of those epistemological dangers and temptations. It turns out, and this was a surprise to me, that some techniques developed by architectural history may come in handy here, though some adjustments might be um, necessary. God is in the detail, we've been told by modernist architects, and in a manner that they would probably not approve of, the book identifies the detail as the site where knowledge and power meet, the interface where the scholar can carry out what Reinhold describes as the media political examination of the in-between. Not that he doesn't look at plans and sections and facades that are the bread and butter of the architectural historian, but he's also interested in the bits and pieces that architectural history doesn't always pay full attention to to valves, seminar tables, lecterns, blackboards, acoustic tiles, dumb waiters that form the media complex of the university. This may look like a familiar move from Rainer Bannon, for example, but is actually very different. Bannon, remember, recognized the platonic elements in architectural modernism's infatuation with the machine, but ultimately replaced one set of conceptual tools purporting to be at the core of the discipline, space and form with another environment and infrastructure. Even as it pays sustained attention to the latter, Knowledge Words offers a model of materialism in which the material a priori is recognized, but as Reinhold puts it, in an underdetermined and underdetermining sense. In his telling, is the university is a machine, it is less a well-oiled machine and more a Rube Goldberg uh, contraption. Things and humans jam it occasionally. It seems to be at constant risk of um, burning down. The reading of the detail is crucial then, but not in some romantic sense that assumes the whole is manifested in the part. This is modernist uh, myth about the God being in the detail. Instead, attention to detail guarantees that the whole of the machine is not granted too much determining power and that its inefficiencies as well as its efficiencies receive a uh, history. This has already come up but looking at the artificial moon suspended from the dome of low library of Columbia designed to manage the attention of the readers below and I love Wei Hong's um, take on the propositions. For example, this yields an unexpected insight in the book that the fixture participated in a strange regime of silence and speech in which one needed to learn to stop speaking before having the freedom to speak. Now, it's significant that the material infrastructure of the university described in the book is not only a network, but more importantly, a chain, or better, a collection of chains. Reinhold writes that the university, especially in its Cold War iterations, operates as a chain or bond that binds students and teachers alike to the imperious dialectic in which Lord and Bondsman are replaced by sovereign knowledge and its products. What I sense, in fact, is a resistance here to the fashionable term network, a resistance which it seems to me is crucial. A chain is not a network. It has built-in orders and hierarchies that need to be taken seriously. The components of a chain cannot come together in just any combination. Their arrangements in space matters. 
A good example is the dumb waiter at Monticello that Mabel has already talked about, uh, uh, which by virtue of its arrangement in space, allow the master to enjoy the services of the servants without ever worrying about being overheard by them. A chain in so short is a physical thing that orders the world around it in patterns of mastery and subordination familiar from Hegelian dialectics. So there's something about the chain that acknowledges conflict and even violence. Finally, the ultimate product of the university machine turns out in the book not to be material, but symbolic form. Yes, that symbolic form that Erwin Konofsky following Ernst Cassier, described as the spiritual meaning attached to the concrete material sign and intrinsically given to the sign. The machine's ultimate product, in other words, is ghosts. Much scholarship these days is eager to leave behind language and representation, but the book urges us to take those symbolic forms seriously, though not necessarily in the way that Panofsky did. In perspective of symbolic form, Panofsky, the historian, looked at painter at painting after painting to isolate perspective as the symbolic form that signified the end of theocracy and the beginning of anthropocracy. In knowledge forms, symbolic forms, I'm sorry, in knowledge worlds, symbolic forms, the cholesterol tube that appears at the end of the book, for example, upon which a linear accelerator was built at Stanford or the Hoover Library Tower on the same campus. These things have signifying power that can arrange capital and labor in radical ways by allowing the university to split wages with industry in this instance. But Panos, what Panofsky never acknowledged is that in a strange feed the uh, feedback loop, these symbolic forms also have the power to produce the hermeneutic subject who now reads those things as symbolic forms. So uh, symbolic forms, arrangements of chains and details. And one thing that I uh, realized when I read the book again is that it doesn't only give us a very robust example of materialist history writing, writing but that its mode of materialist reasoning is actually informed by techniques of architectural history. And I would love to hear Reinhold um, talk more about this close detailing of, close reading of details, for example, or analysis of facades, but not without some significant adjustments, uh, as I try to explain in the case of uh, the symbolic form of the tube and the, and the tower. This, I have to say, was a genuine uh, surprise this time around. And the question, I think, at least for those of us in architectural history, will be what to do with those techniques now that we have the advantage of having read the wonderful knowledge works. Wonderful. Thank you, Zainab. Uh, in fact, uh, thank you to all the panelists. I'll, um, we have reach the supposed endpoint, but we are um, assured that we can go on until let's say 220 or 225 or something like that. I think maybe it might be kind of nice if the panelists all join visually so that we can have Reinhold, you know, imagine or not have to imagine who he's speaking to. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have incredible questions. I'll let you respond. We have cybernetics as methods, whether it's complex is meant to evoke a psychoanalytic reading uh, to what extent the um, the effects of uh, elemental later elemental universities were already present in the Jeffersonian architecture of UVA and of course uh, to what extent the chain is in fact different from the network we actually have we need you to go one way or the other in a way uh, Reinhold so I'm, I'm excited to hear the response maybe take you know 10 10 minutes or so and then we'll open it up to Q&A and I encourage the audience to put their questions in the Q&A well, well, first of all, thank you uh, so much, uh, Wei Hung, Mabel, and Zainab, for this, these incredible questions, these incredible readings. I mean, as I said, just first of all, for reading the thing and, and, and reading it so thoughtfully and carefully and critically, too. I mean, I, you know, I, there are interesting debates that we could have in here, too, I think, that we maybe can try to tease out around some of the questions you raised. There's no way I could possibly answer, I think, all of them. 
I, I will. I just want to. I want to just say one thing about uh, in in response to Wayang's question about cybernetics as method, because you really hit on the head of something that I, I have since I first began writing about cybernetics have thought about, uh, and I don't feel, you know, remains kind of unresolved as a as at least as a proposition. Um, and then and then I'll try to actually I have one thought of an example that might tie together these three um, elements of these three cases. Though obviously not all of them, but. So I think, you know, the reflexivity and recursivity question, it seems to me as, because it's true, this is not a linear history. This is, it, it proceeds chronologically, but there are returns of various kinds. And I think, you know, Mabel picked up, I mean, there, there you know, I think all of you, I mean, Zainab, when you mentioned the Yale report, that, that's familiar, it should be familiar because we're still haunted by some of those problems. And, and so it's not, this isn't simply a matter of continuities, or discontinuities as much as I would say at least of recursions and, and a certain kind of self-awareness, a kind of meta uh, perspective that especially um, scholars have, I mean, you know, on, on, their, on the history of their institutions, it, you know, one of the problems and challenges of doing this kind of work is you go into any very well-appointed often, not always, but well-appointed university or college archive and, and it's all laid out there for you. I mean, the whole story is there you basically just take dictation, you kind of zero, you know, scan the, the, the documents and then reproduce. And, and, you know, there is a genre of intellectual history that unfortunately I think is prone to this, that, that will repeat certain stories. And, and with those stories, you know, like for example, the, the shift from, from ecclesiastical reason to secular reason in the, from the colleges to the universities. Now, you know, the, 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 the best histories don't go near those kind of problems, but they're still lurking in the background. And so this approach <clears throat> of attending to the recursivities is at least is one way to, to, to think about continuity and change and at the same time about <clears throat> teleology in, in a manner that acknowledges a certain tendency from liberal to neoliberal reason. Uh, but but it, 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 one that is not at all inevitable, uh, that is always subject to revision, that's provisional contingent, and, and, and most importantly, in terms of the feedback loops out of which the whole thing is constructed, um, recursive. So, okay, just very quickly on the, try to tie them to the things together. I thought there's one example in one of the chapters, uh, the second, it's the, the chapter after the one that, that you mentioned, Zainab, um, the, the chapter on geometry and on teaching an, another kind of classical language, which is, and, and not just teaching, excuse me, but circulate, um, circulating in print, uh, Euclid. And, and so, you know, so, you know, in a sense, this breaks down like, okay, in the classical colleges, ancient Greek and Latin were the, the sort of, uh, you know, core of the core, so to speak. In the um, military academies like West Point and in polytechnics like Rensselaer, uh, and, and then in many other such sort of environments where modern technologies were the object uh, of, of, of learning and, and, and reproduction, uh, Euclidean geometry played a, a, a comparably classic role. Uh, and of course it is a classical uh, form of knowledge. Um, and I try to show there how the, the, the use of illustrations uh, and Zainab, the, I salute your own work on, on drawing uh, in this regard very much. Um, and, and on the kind of sort of, I guess we could say the, a certain element of the optical unconscious of modernism or the kind of graphic unconscious of modernism. Um, that, uh, that whether or not the, there are diagrams used to illustrate the, the propositional structure of Euclid matters in this case, because there are different theories of, of, of learning and of knowledge production, and specifically with respect to the calculus, which was seen to be the kind of mark of uh, higher learning in, in uh, mathematics, um, which uh, did not need, which relied more on algebra than, than on, on visual uh, uh, sort of diagrams. So, so the so this and the, you know so behind the the architectural drawings that Mabel was referring to and we you know, those of us who who studied this know you know is Euclid still in some way uh, you know uh, we could also say Descartes in when we look at our computer screens and see the grids uh, but but certainly Euclid in uh, in in the way that 
I'm, I'm, I'm trying to describe it. So in terms of the use of the tools, uh, you know, Zainab, that you were asking, and, and others asked me in particular too, uh, that's one of them. Just, you know, looking, understanding a, a certain kind of visual um, language is, is in, in, a, in a way too metaphorical, a, a form of visual cognition. Uh, that that can be distinguished from textual cognition, but not in an absolute sense because these are intermediately related. And, and when you look at, at the various translations of Euclid from the middle of the 19th century, you see quite literally there inter, the, the, a kind of contest going on in their relation, the relation of text and, and diagram. So, uh, and, and it's, it's that that uh, finally on the chain uh, that, that helps to make build chains because this is what establishes hierarchies between different forms of, of knowledge, between you know, a kind of new classicism in the math departments that were, were growing in, in the research universities and the empiricism uh, of, um, what, what, uh, uh, of, of, of the engineers, uh, you know, the Euclidean empiricism of, of the new machines. So uh, that, that helped to make and build and, and understand the new machine. So this, this, these contraptions. So in any way, and I, I hope that that at least brings this so much more to, to tie together, but perhaps there are others in the Q&A that we can, but thanks so much. I, it's really very thoughtful. Yeah, the, um, I have, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. I think also the moderator's privilege is to be able to ask their own question. Um, but following up on the, on the chain, um, I was reminded when I read your book, especially with the great books, the, there's this amazing image in the book for the audience of a number of persons standing in front of a, basically a mock-up of great ideas. There's a number of great ideas, each represented by either a book or a piece of paper. It's this incredible manifestation of the greatness of knowledge. And of course, in this age of trying, certain persons trying to make things great again, I was, um, it made me think about mass culture and mass media and the, and the way in which your definition of media actually is not you don't refer to the discourse on mass media particularly, uh, but I was reminded when I read your book of um, some discourse on the American army as being a mass army. The first truly great 20th century arm, mass army is the American army, but it is enabled by the same kind of chains of command that you describe here, which is small details, which allow a kind of dissemination of decision-making and therefore obedience at every rank. So I wonder to what extent you can imagine the American University, because you, you haven't really described the kind of reception of all these chains of, um, so can you say something about that? What would it mean to then, you know, investigate that? Yeah, well, first of all, let us uh, take the two parts. What, the first part that you're referring to is the Great Books Program that I, this is, you know, a response to Alan Bloom, basically, and, and or a rereading of the debates around the relation between mass culture and and high you know uh, high culture supposedly in the 1980s uh, and you know the western canon and and all of its alleged desecrations um, and uh, and my argument in that chapter is is i try to show this empirically in those <laughs> including in the image you're talking about is that basically what is the western canon it's a list it's a list that was disseminated, you know, in a mass mediated fashion. Basically it's a mass media product. It put out by Encyclopedia Britannica, edited by Mortimer Adler and Robert Hutchins from the University of Chicago. And, and, and you know, in a really very, very interesting way, disseminated uh, around the country into like local libraries and, and there were reading groups around, around the great books. Uh, and of course there were, there were colleges like St. John's founded around this idea and, and not to say uh, the Columbia Corps and the Corps of Chicago. Um, and, and so the, the, in terms of the change, there's a contest going on, which is something that's familiar to us. Uh, they're not just the, the there, there's an element of this that is, that is, you know, profoundly sort of fundamentalist in the worst way that, that you know, it, it, attempting to claim a certain kind of heritage, you know, the greatness story you're alluding to, Lucia, that we've seen again in this, this we, we saw it actually coming out of the former administration in the, um, uh, the document that they published in the last month called the 1776 report, uh, which tried to make the American high school, uh, make American history classical again, uh, in other words, to whitewash um, the American history uh, by, by claiming that, that teaching the history of slavery and so on was, 
um, you know, somehow diminished uh, these kind of ideals and that, that are allegedly written into the constitution, et cetera. So, you know, there's a kind of originalist and, 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 and sort of um, what you, you could, some of you have called foundationalist perspective there. Um, now that, you know, okay, that's the, the vulgar version, but, but there are sophisticated discussions going on about the relationship between classical learning and, uh, and, 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 you know, something like engineering or other forms of modern learning and the military, of course, is exactly where, you know, but my, the point, my point has been not to flatten them for sure. And I think I take Zainab's point about the networks and actor network theory too, that this is, these are not flat networks, but rather to, to recognize that those, for example, I didn't write about this, but we could, the soldiers who came, uh, you know, back, went to college under the GI bill um, I mean, what did they do? They, this is, was Mumford's problem when he was at Stanford trying to redo the humanities curriculum in the 40s, that he was invited there to do that. And, and they knew that there, there, was, there were all these returning soldiers coming and you know, how to teach this you, you know, modernist, but still in some ways classicist idea of the humanities that we associate with Mumford um, to, to people who had just been trained in killing. Uh, and so, you know, this, this is something like why it was necessary to teach Euclid at West Point to produce a modern army in a certain way, you know, a, a hundred or so years earlier, uh, but now in reverse, how to deprogram. And at MIT, you had another version of this uh, within in nuclear physics and so on, all, all seeking a kind of new humanism and spiritual, the scientists seeking spiritual uh, sort of renewal or, or at least um, uh, some form of uh, kind of a seeking to retrieve their humanity from 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 uh, from the, the the sort of shadow of the bomb. Yeah. So um, there's a, a a related question on the chain from uh, uh, Valérie Lechen. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that too French. Uh, which asks, how does the term chain in the production of knowledge and the production of access to knowledge and capital through the distribution of academic degrees? posit the supply chains that allow for the accumulation of capital? That seems like a question you would want to be able to answer. And I'll, um, there's after that a much lighter question perhaps about what Norbert Wiener would think about the newer architecture at MIT and Columbia. So I'll, I'll ask you to lead with the question of the relationship between this chain that we're talking about um, to the chain of uh, the supply chains of capital and then maybe leave us with thoughts on newest campus architecture, <laughs> if I can um, ask that. Okay, well, hi, Valerie. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, you know, theoretically, um, they, they, one could make the connections. What I've tried to do me methodologically is to avoid metaphors as much as, you know, to take chains as literally as possible, while at the same time, obviously, you know, using this term uh, in a figurative manner. But, but, but not, I should maybe better say, um, not uh, be satisfied with, with the metaphorical use of a term like chain. And so we would want to understand materially and historically the actual connections and, and circuits and other relations that, that the supply chains that we speak of today uh, inscribe and, and you know, sort of um, move through. And so in the case of, of university-based knowledge, the, 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 um, the globalization of universities uh, that began, I mean, in a way, these, these colleges and universities were always global in one way or the other, uh, but in the, in the current sense in which we mean this term, uh, that, that, that this began, we could say, in the 1990s, uh, but is associated with the distance learning programs that I was just talking about with respect to the great book. So now we have this problem, which we are living today, of teaching not, on a, not just on a campus in these buildings, uh, uh, but also uh, across space and, and, and across time zones um, over interfaces like the one that we're using right now uh, that themselves build chains. Whether or not these are exactly analogous or, or, or strictly uh, related to the supply chains that, that, that we're talking about that, that lead ultimately to factories typically would, would depend on the, the sort of meaningfulness of the metaphor from the book from the 60s of the university as a knowledge factory. So to the extent that what we're doing is making something here, 
and we might be making it over these channels uh, that are now extended uh, uh, around the world. And these are material channels. They're bouncing off satellites. There are screens on either end. There are translations of various kinds and so on. There are interfaces. Uh, that, that yes, I do think that we can, we can and probably should uh, think uh, in terms of supply and demand because that's how the administrators at universities who are, who are monetizing these systems and charging tuition at a distance, for example, um, are, uh, are, are thinking. So, so we need to learn to think, you know, like our masters. So, <laughs> oh, uh, did I did I miss something? Oh, the, no, 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 the buildings. So finally, the buildings. I should say that um, the person asking the question, not necessarily, what do you think of the architecture at MIT? What would Norbert Wiener think? What, right? Nor what would Norbert Wiener think? Um, and this person's name is Andrew Caspi. Thanks, Andrew. Um, you know, I, I don't know what Norbert would think about. It depends on which building we're talking about. I, I suppose you know. I suppose you're you're thinking about the new, like the Gary um, building. We could we could use some of the newer. Um, we could look at the Mind Brain Behavior Building at Columbia, for example, in this way. Uh, and, and in addition to the sort of logic uh, and 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 violence uh, of the frontier that that these, you know, spatially, uh, urbanistically, but also symbolically that, that, that buildings like this uh, reproduce. Um, there's, a, there's something else, and I, 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 maybe I'll generalize your question to the, general, to the question of the campus as is kindly, currently being rethought as basically a business school uh, in, in which, student, which the, the role of the table is, is different. I think if you look in, in some of these new buildings, you'll see tables like, and lots of coffee and you know, other elements of, of a certain kind of, um, Googleization uh, of, of of our of knowledge and of learning that that and you know are designed around terms like design and and re reconstruct uh, teams in various ways like gather teams around them so teams teamwork and so on. So what would Nor Wiener think about that? He I th he probably would understand that this is what he meant. This is this is one of the consequences of what he meant when he wrote a book called The Human Use of Human Beings. In other words, what we're seeing here is, 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 is strictly cybernetic in, in its latter day form, you know, third or maybe even fourth generation cybernetics uh, uh, using the machines and interfaces that we're, we use and, uh, you know, miniaturized and, and, and made wireless and so on. But, but the, the, those who gather at those tables, that their principal, in a sense, um, I think, uh, compulsion is to recognize their and to discover or rediscover a, a kind of humanity amid, amidst all of this. Uh, now, some for some that would be redemptive. For some, the coffee bars and all the rest redeem, they humanize, you know, the computer or you know the old mainframes, which is what Wiener was thinking about when he was writing those books, the big mainframe computers uh, that IBM and others were building in, in the in the fifties. Um, but but it, it, you know the the latter two chapters of, of my book make the case that this process of humanization um, is uh, integrated with and, and belongs to the logic of the military industrial academic complex that people like J. Robert Oppenheimer were trying to resist the very designer of the of the, of the nuclear bomb. Uh, were trying to, to, to oppose and resist uh, when they understood its consequences. So it turns out the kind of you know, human interaction around a table, sometimes planned by anthropologists or sociologists, other social scientists working for design firms or, or as consultants uh, in the design of these buildings, um, is machinic in, in, in a very specific and I think quite important way. Uh, that I think we can recognize in other elements uh, of everyday life and, of course, academic life. So. Well, that's a perfect um, chilling. But <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> detail, I should say, to end on a detail of the the shape and and instantiations that those chains take. So, um, well, abruptly, I will say thank you to Reinhold for the book. First of all. Uh, thank you to our panelists, Mabel, Weihang, and Zainab for these sort of brilliant further provocations based on the book. Thank you to the audience for coming. Uh, we, uh, you should be seeing in your chat 
uh, an opportunity to buy this book and to uh, send your own questions and comments to Reinhold, whose email address is public information. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, uh, here in New York, it is uh, 2, 2.23 on a Friday afternoon, so we will all probably try to go enjoy the, um, the weather. But I want to thank everybody, and thank you also to uh, Kay at the Heyman Center, who's been helping us make this move. Thanks to all, and uh, for more conversations. Thank you all. To be continued. Thank <laughs> you.